morning. This, my name is Grant Schwartzwalder, president of OTA Compression, OTA Environmental, and we've been doing these webinars now for about eight weeks, uh, a variety of topics from finance to, to healthcare, a variety of things. We see it as our mission to, to help the, uh, the oil industry with some education that might be able to make their, uh, uh, their decisions, their business decisions, their uh, 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 operations uh, more efficient. So I appreciate you joining. We were fortunate to have uh, Stephen Robertson and the Permian Basin Petroleum Association co-sponsor this with us and uh, are very thankful for their participation and uh, them bringing in some really interesting uh, topics. As you know, we've had uh, speakers from uh, like on bankruptcy, on the environmental issues, uh, rural health care, a very eclectic uh, uh, list of topics. If you've missed any of those and you want to see them, they are on uh, our uh, YouTube channel, which should be, the link should be attached to the invitation that you received. Uh, so if you find any of those topics of interest, this one will, uh, presentation will also be uh, recorded. So if, uh, if you miss some brilliant comments that David will make, you can, uh, there you go. How about that for a plug, David? But uh, then you'll be able to record that or share it with some other individuals. Uh, so again, it, the link should be on the invitation. Uh, it'll take a couple of days for us to download and and uh, kind of clean up uh, a few things that we have to do for, because of how we get it from Zoom. Uh, next week, we will have uh, Will Skeen, uh, who is the chairman of Edge Capital Group, talking about macroeconomics of the industry, of the, uh, of the oil industry, but also just of general, uh, especially in light of what's happened with COVID and, and all the, uh, the flux that that puts that in. So that should be a, a fascinating conversation as well. I urge you to participate. After that, we have Christy Craddock, who is the uh, uh, commissioner, one of the commissioners on the Railroad Commission. Uh, obviously quite a few uh, topics that are of concern there from flaring to proration it's been a, a kind of busy time there. So I think we've got some good topics coming up, but, uh, but I'm personally very excited about having uh, uh, David Hayes on. I've known David for probably two decades, it seems. Uh, he started with Natural Gas Partners in 1998, uh, has moved all the way up, is a partner there now, uh, works on origination and maintaining the portfolio. I always find uh, conversations with him very enlightening because of his uh, his understanding of the macro issues, but then v involvement in the very specifics of uh, the company's operation. So I'm, I'm excited to have David here and uh, welcome him. And let me uh, just start off with a kind of a the the obvious one of obviously with a lot of the oil price and COVID, a lot of changes have happened. How has Natural Gas Partners handled that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, it was uh, it's a pretty amazing transition, as everybody knows. We, um, we are half-owned by the Carlisle Group up, up in D.C., so we were getting pretty early information in, in the January, February time about the, the progression of the virus. Um, Carlisle was having weekly uh, one-on-ones with, with Dr. Fauci when when nobody else knew who Dr. Fauci was. Um, so we, you know, we implemented travel bans internally in February and then locked down the office in early March, which was helpful because we actually had somebody uh, contract the disease um, the second, second or third week of, of March. Uh, fortunately, it didn't, didn't spread around our office, but um, not a moment too soon. Portfolio-wide, um, you know, we shut down reg activity very quickly. Um, fortunate to not have any uh, meaningful rig contracts that there were an impediment to that or other obligations, but acted quickly to shut down um, activity and then ultimately shut in a lot of production, which I think was a you know, big discussion point. Um, you mentioned about the, the proration discussions at the Railroad Commission. We ultimately, I, th I think more as a, to make the point, um, through our support behind <clears throat> that that discussion, along with Pioneer and, and Parsley, but um, you know it, it was really just an acknowledgement that that um, 
the, you had to do something on the supply side and, and do it quickly because demand had eroded literally overnight. So, you know, company by company, we, I, I think we're fortunate to, to not have, not, not be over levered uh, and have uh, good hedge positions. Um, and in selective cases, we monetize hedges, which were, we were able to, to eliminate um, existing debt. Um, you, know, you know, you don't do that willy nilly, but, but um, we, we did do that on, select, on, on certain, in certain circumstances where, where it made sense. Um, beyond that, communicating with the banks, I think, you, you know, the banks had enough problems going into COVID and they were only expanded and exacerbated by, by this dynamic and they've been running around with their hair on fire. And I think our, our communication was that we were responding um, rapidly to the, the changing dynamic and <clears throat> it's a little bit of the, the, just giving them comfort that they've got problems, but, but you're not one of them. And, um, and I think that's, that's, that was a, a uh, that's an important part of that relationship is, is not being a problem, problem borrower. <laughs> um, you know, beyond that, just focusing on, on what you can control. And there's a lot of stuff in the business environment and in life in general, that's, it's out of everybody's control. So, um, cost really focused on costs in the, in the field, in the office, um, rebid a lot of, a lot of services, um, technologies, you know, other vendors, um, to try to, to try to rationalize those costs. And, and then we had to do some consolidation, um, in an effort to, to high grade and <clears throat> further rationalize costs. So nothing, I think extraordinary, um, you know, when you really sit back, but things again, the sitting idly option, if you're, if you're uh, responsibly owning and, and running. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. It's, you mentioned that you've consolidated several of your portfolio companies or alluded to that. Uh, that seems to be one of the themes of that private equity has done as a whole. Um, kind of trying to respond, but how, what, do you, what else do you think will be happening in the future with for private equity uh, portfolio companies? And then I want to ease into pr private equity sponsors like NGP and NCAP and the such. Yeah, we were, you know, we were well down the road of consolidation um, by the first of this year. So <clears throat> there were, there were a couple other pieces that, that became necessary subsequent to, to the March timeframe, but we were already well, well down that path, I think ahead of the curve. Um, it is something that's, that's happening across the private equity space. Um, but uh, I think we, we more or less have wrapped that up as of, as of the middle of the year. Uh, beyond that, I think really at, at $40 oil, there's not there's not a, a, a lot of development that makes sense, so there is a an, a requirement to to be lean and to be able to to weather the storm <clears throat> until um, until the macro improves and you can really get back to developing resources in earnest. But um, no, I, the the well, how do you look at, you know, y'all obviously naturally as partners been around a long, long time, you've got a reputation, but there's a lot of new private equity groups that have come about over the last several years and they've got to be getting pinched. How, uh, talk to me about how you see the private equity market uh, uh, kind of moving forward. I'll throw this out. I know you don't, might not want to talk, obviously we won't talk about specifics, but I got to believe that there's some of these private equity sponsors that will cease to exist going forward because they just can't raise money. Is that right or am I wrong? No, no, it's, that's right. I mean, the, there, there will be far less capital available in the, in the energy private equity, at least as it relates to conventional uh, hydrocarbon backed energy 
um, the amount of capital available is going to decrease significantly, pro probably by maybe as much as half. Um, and the number of firms is going to fall by a, by a like amount, if not more. Um, so there, there will be survivors. Um, we, we, uh, we plan to be one of those, but, um, likely with, with less capital available, uh, at least for the immediate subsequent funds. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's around performance. This industry broadly hasn't performed. We, we may have performed better, um, than, you know, than, than average within the industry, but, it, but it's still not a, a wildly compelling absolute return when you look at alternatives that, that people have. And, you know, uh, you, you could have invested in, in uh, McDonald's for the last 10 years and earned a, a much better return than, than owning really anything in, in the oil and gas world. Um, so that's, and, and then, you know, you have the narrative, especially on the coasts, that, that oil and gas demand is going to zero. You know that's that's a false narrative, but it but it it does drive the 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 attention of investors who are potential you know public and private investors into into conventional energy. They're kind of like, why why am I bo bothering with that? You guys are are all going away, and everybody will be driving Teslas. Um, we can roll our eyes, but it <clears throat> but it does impact their behavior at least in the short term. And the only way we're really going to get their attention back is to is to generate returns, both in an absolute in a in a compelling relative sense. So, I think that's that's the task we're always charged with with making money, but it's a uh, you know it's an even bigger task when you're when you've got the headwinds of the the environmental narrative that you're part part of the problem, not part of the solution. Let me take this point to also remind everyone that if you have questions, there is a, a place in your uh, Zoom call to type in a question and I'd be happy to take those and include those in. Uh, so just be aware of all that. Uh, so David, back, you talk about that it's really hard in a conventional kind of oil and gas way to make money right now. Uh, obviously, you have got to have a strategy to make money, as you said, otherwise there's no reason to exist. So does that imply that you change your strategy somehow or, or do you just wait out? And, and kind of as an aside of that is, I know one of your uh, uh, competitors just raised a bunch of money for an ESG type focus. Uh, that's obviously a hot area, but the question is, can you make money with that? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think there's some fundamental things in this business that are very positive. And if, Sticking with those fundamentals <clears throat> of you know gathering assets in whatever form, acquisition, leasing, that um, have compelling re reinvestment, and then diligently, thoughtfully reinvesting and managing the business with prudent leverage, um, aggressive hedging, focus on cost. You know, there's there's things that are just fundamental to the business that can generate returns and are good good business practices broadly. So I think that part of the business um, will, will be where capital, that, that general framework is where capital will, will still be available. I think what, what you've seen business models stray over the last five to 10 years have been resource extension, you know, the, the um, step out, drill a couple of wells, flip it as people are trying to build their inventory and, and Wall Street's kind of cheering that on. Wall Street's not cheering anymore. They don't, they don't know, I don't even think they're paying attention. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it's play, playing that isn't gonna be rewarded. It's gonna be about generating returns. We were already kind of in that, in that narrative um, before before COVID hit, <clears throat> and I think um, I, th I think it's just going to be accelerated, and they're going to there's there's clearly restructurings going on. 
there's a lot of zombie companies, public companies out there that, that um, are going to be restructured or consolidated. There, there should be more consolidation. It's not, not happening because there's a, there's a lot of impediments to it, but or at least not happening as rapidly as it probably should. Um, but I think there'll be a lot more focus on um, how is capital being reinvested? Is it, is it being done efficiently? And if, if not, it needs to be returned to investors. So with that, let me just make sure I understand. There, there used to be a big play of the horizontals, the unconventionals, like you say, prove out some acreage and grow. You, I think I'm hearing you say that's probably not going to be near the focus if yes, no, but then also then does that shift to just more conventional production and just kind of more running a true oil company as opposed to kind of trying to prove up acreage and flip? Well, I, I think, I think, um, I think, I think the, the industry will still be largely focused on unconventionals and primarily horizontal development. It'll just, the, it'll, the capital will go to where the the returns are are kind of undeniable. I'll use uh, you know Southeast New Mexico. There's there's some just first class rock there. Um, why go drill in in southern Pecos County or central Pecos County when you, we kind of know where the, the the resource is and you're not being rewarded nor is it is it really prudent um, to go try to step out and prove prove an extensional wolf camp play or anything else there um, it, it's just it's just not what what you need to do so I think we will we will be drilling wells again when when oil's back call it in the fifty dollar range and they will be unconventional and they will be horizontal but um, it's a uh, it'd be much more development focused. Anything that, that even whiffs of exploration is, is, is not a near term focus for, for capital public or private. Okay. You mentioned about bankruptcy and restructuring, but that there was quite a few impediments. I'd like to explore that with you a little bit because you know, you read and they say, you know, there's obviously been quite a few bankruptcies already, but their expectation of another, 200 is what I've seen up to what uh, what were those impediments and and how do we how do you see that whole restructuring and bankruptcy playing out um, you know, a lot of its bond, bonds you've got bonds of companies um, they're trading at 40 cents on the dollar <clears throat> something like that where there's still some equity value that at least in the you know that in a trading sense, that's, that's all option value. So you have these companies that are, they're wounded and you have stronger companies out there, but, but they, they can't, they can't um, give anything to the equity, but the equity is still kind of controlling management's still kind of controlling. They're playing, they're, they're representing the equity. They're playing for equity value. Um, so they're, you know, they're trying to extend the runway, hoping that, I don't know, oil goes to 80 bucks or, or something. And you just, you, you really have to negotiate with the bondholders. Um, it's just, it's just complicated um, to, to try to get in there and say, well, you pick somebody, pick a, an EOG that, that's, that's a very uh, well capitalized sound company. They, they might look at an opportunity and go, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll trade our equity for, to the bonds for, that are trading at 40 cents for 50, 50 cents worth of our equity, but we're not giving the equity anything. And, but the equity still calls the shots. So I just use that as a, as a representative example of, of there's some good assets trapped in bad balance sheets. There's a lot of bad assets trapped in bad balance sheets, but um, you know, the, the need for cost rationalization for <clears throat> high grading, um, where capital gets redeployed is, um, is sort of a, a broad industry problem and cap capital structures, in, entrenched management, entrenched boards, um, 
and, and just other structural impediments are, are not allowing for some of that to, to happen quite as quickly. One, one of the nice things on the, on the private is the, the consolidations that we've been able to do in our, in our portfolios um, can happen more efficiently and, and, and reasonably. I do think, you know, the, 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 the push of the industry on the public side over the past five plus years, and we were, we were a big part of it, taking companies like RSP and Rice Energy Public that were pure plays. Um, that was a nice thing because there was a lot of visibility to the public market. Um, today, I think you need optionality to, to allow certain assets to be whether it's because gas prices are depressed or, or um, differentials are, are goofy or whatever, certain assets need to be star for capital and others need to be, um, you know, where the capital flows and, and the, ha the pure play, um, the pure play limits some of that. So it's, it's nice when, when the asset is, is first class, but you, I always I always think about ultra petroleum, which which had a, a great heyday and call it the 2004 to 2008 window. It was about the best thing going. It was, a, it was absolute pure play and stock went from a buck to a hundred bucks and, and a $15 billion market cap. And I think you know that asset is as fantastic as it was for that time is now going through its third restructuring in, in the last five years. So, <clears throat> you know, I just use that as a, as an example of something that, that is, is wildly compelling in a moment of time can, can lose steam either because of the macro or because of, um, oil versus gas. I mean, that's part of the macro, but, uh, other performance issues, uh, field extension, degradation, whatever, you just, uh, you need some flexibility to, to refocus capital and um, impediments to that are, are just an inefficiency that I think the industry needs to, to, to solve. We had a question that asked about in the Permian Basin, uh, the value of tier one acreage versus tier two acreage they even asked how much would y'all pay for that now uh, in part i think i already know kind of what y'all your answer might be but what can you say to how you value tier one acreage tier two acreage and if you were trying to do a deal right now yeah it's um you know i i if i could go back call it five five ten years um you know aubrey mcclendon when when chesapeake was was blowing going and and he had somewhat limitless um, access to capital sort of set a market and and it, it was just for illustrative purposes pretty linear you had kind of core core acreage at x and tier one at 0.8x and tier two at 0.6x and and but but there was a bid for tier two three four just at a at a at a discount to whatever was deemed the core tier one. And, and I think the evolution to those pure plays, and I'll use RSP, was that the public market recognized <clears throat> that the core should be valued more. And so in my example, we're a sort of t stair step down, the core got bid way up. And tier one sort of, you know, the next step down had a bid and then as, as the capital got flushed on everything else, bids for tier two through four just, they went away completely. And I think that's still the market that we're in. Um, now the valuations of everything has come down, including the core of the core. Um, but uh, I think today there's, there's still a bid by, by people who have capital for the core and probably in kind of that next, next stage down um, but there's no bid for anything beyond that. And I don't think that, I don't see that changing, um, unless, and if we, we, you know, we have a, a, uh, wildly unexpected macro rebound 
in the face of improving demand and you know the the, the supply constraints we're going to have by by not reinvent not having the investment that we've had over the past decade. You want to throw out a dollar amount for that core acreage that you you think you see or or not? <clears throat> I mean, you know, um, those core call it the EOG Red Hills area in southeast New Mexico. There's probably still bids that you know in the twenty thousand an acre type type range. I think mm -hmm. you know if, if the if the the drilling economics at forty five dollar oil or or you know with the current cost structures are there there's there's probably some bids um out there it's not a deep it's not nearly as deep as it as it was um in terms of participants in that but um you know that it, it it's the best stuff out there and you know maybe there's core midland basin type stuff that's that's similar but um any anything that's extensional, anything that it's got question around it, is a you know either either no bid or or a significant discount to whatever the the valuations in the in the known core are. You mentioned a, a, the kind of the macroeconomic dis discussion between oil and gas uh, a few months ago. All of a sudden, it was like, uh, okay, let's head toward natural gas. It's it's coming back around doesn't seem like I'm hearing that as much lately. Is that, uh, do y'all have a position on oil versus natural gas? Um, we, we, we haven't really been particularly bullish on, on gas for a while. Um, I've watched a lot of gas contrarians over the past five plus years. Um, uh, plow money after that. Um, you know the, the the issue I can see there being supply constraints on gas because of associated gas or shut-ins or other other things um, in the near term. But the reality is, we we have discovered a, a lot of gas resources that are accessible at a relatively low cost in a in a relatively short amount of time. So you, know, you, you see the 2021 gas strip up at 260 or so, but then it, you know, then it falls back off into the 240 range. And I, I, I can see that, that that type of shape of, of a curve is probably something that we're going to live with for um, at least the next five years, if not, if not the next decade. So natural but, gas only looks better because oil looks a whole lot worse. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, a big a big part of the depression of gas prices was is the associated gas. I mean, people in the Permian are 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 producing or drilling wells with, in some cases, accepting that they will be paying to to produce their gas, um, and and the the regulations you know, you were you were discussing the Chrissy Craddock and the flaring. That's only that's only going to exacerbate that. So. Um, you know, now that activity is is reduced, you you won't have the growth in supply. But it's uh, you know the Marcellus, the Haynesville. We there, there's a lot there's a lot of gas out there, yeah. which is good. If it's good for consumers. It's good. It's good for the the country. But uh, it's it's been a challenge for owners of of gas resources. I. You know, I at one point I I had a little little better math, but um, I think if you if you go back ten years to when Exxon bought XDO for forty five billion dollars, and that was get a gas weighted deal, um, <clears throat> I think XDO was producing like two and a half BCF E a day, whatever. A point I I think big picture today you could you could buy the entire North American gas industry, which is 50 plus percent larger than it was a decade ago for, for less than 20% of what you could buy, could have bought it a decade ago. Does that make sense? Yeah. Big, much, much bigger base of production for, you know, for 80, 80 plus percent off. It's uh, 
you know, we, we, we drilled our way, way in into a, an oversupply situation. Sounds like Rex Tillerson agrees with you since he came out and said they probably overpaid for XTO. Uh, it's, uh, well, we talked, you mentioned Flare, so that moves us to the last topic I wanted to hit with you is ESG. Does it matter anymore? You know, six months ago, uh, my sense was that private equity firms could not go to their institutional investors without having a very robust conversation on ESG with the emphasis being the E, the environmental. Uh, where does that stand now and, and are, do they care now? Uh, and kind of the future of that, given that people are more worried about surviving? Yeah, no, they, they care. Um, I, th I think that's a trend that, that, is, that has been moving along for, for a while and isn't gonna be reversed. It's a, you know, I talked about the narrative on, on the coast of, around energy and you know, the environmental dynamic, which I, I think is uh, the, their perception of the environmental stewardship of the oil and gas industry is not good. So anything that, um, that, that doesn't, anything that detracts from an already not good, even if it's unwarranted, is not helpful to, to um, reattracting capital. Um, so we don't need to do anything to, to further um, hurt our, our causes for, for getting, getting capital. I mean, the, again, the best thing we can do is generate returns, but I don't think, I don't think a lot of larger capital sources, pension funds, public, you know, the Black Rocks of the world are going to, uh, going to allow themselves to invest in something that, yeah, there's returns there, but, but it comes with all sorts of, of, of mess. It, it, we've got to, we got to do both. Um, so it, it is very important. I know our, our investors, we, we have a, a ongoing, um, r reporting around ESG and it, you know, we have, we have, people dedicated to, to, uh, compiling the, the data. It's, it's a, a topic in every board meeting that we do in terms of reporting around safety and, and environmental <coughs> compliance, um, and making sure that we're, we're kind of certainly not the problem and, and more, more ideally kind of in the top quartile, if not the top decile of, of measurable st statistics. Very good. Well, David, I see that it's 1103 and I want to be uh, uh, appreciative of your time and our uh, attendees time. So I'll cut it here, but hopefully everyone saw the reason why I was excited about having David uh, always find him very insightful and, uh, and thoughtful in his, uh, his words. So David, thank you very much for your time and wish you the best. And, and uh, to everyone else, if hope you, uh, participate in our future ones. Again, next Wednesday will be uh, we'll ski in with Edge and then Christy Craddock Railroad Commission after that. Uh, if you have any questions or any uh, guests that you would like for us to, uh, uh, to host, please let us know that as well. And then of course, look at the YouTube uh, uh, channel for uh, if you wanna see any of the past presentations. But again, thank you very much, David and uh, have, a, have a great week.